This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue unlearning the world with Book 2. In Chapter 3, this is the last and final part of Section 1, Ordering of Thought, Part 2. The split in the mind is horrifying. So the mind tries to project the split to give itself some relief or the illusion of relief. As we go on with this passage, it will get clear about how this ordering of thought has to be ended for the split to get healed. Guilt is inescapable by those who believe they order their own thoughts and must therefore obey their dictates. This makes them feel responsible for their errors without recognizing that. By accepting this responsibility, they are reacting irresponsibly. If the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself, and I assure you that it is, then the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours. Text, Chapter 5, Section 5 This is a major area of level confusion that is easy to fall into. People think that because they invented the world they see and receive as they have asked, then they must be responsible for their cancer and for the starving children. He is saying right here that the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours. The self-concept itself cannot be yours. The dilemma cannot be resolved except by accepting the solution of undoing. All we are responsible for at any time is for accepting the atonement, for choosing the miracle. In the ultimate sense, that must be the way out. If I am responsible for the starving children, or this or that, then guilt has to remain. The starving children are just one example. Since ideas leave not their source, and thoughts and images are one and the same. A most subtle example was when you flipped the thing up on the suitcase and said, What have I done? Just a twinge, even a minor twinge, indicates that we are responsible for doing it, that we are responsible for something in form. You would be responsible for the effects of all your wrong thinking if it could not be undone. The purpose of the atonement is to save the past in purified form only. If you accept the remedy for disordered thought, a remedy whose efficacy is beyond doubt, how can its symptoms remain? Text Chapter 5, Section 5 The purpose of the atonement is to save the past in purified form only. What in the world does that mean? To save the past in purified form is simply to be the dreamer of the dream and see that all the images are false and that there is no ordering among those images. You are just watching a bunch of images on a screen. Of course you are defenseless. 
if you are just dreaming it and you know that it is all false and it is all past and you are living in the present you are watching the past from the present then you are saving the past in the purified form we are still in the perceptual realm but we are talking about saving the past in the purified form it is simply being in the right mind not caught in the story of the figures on the screen or in the ordering of thought not caught in the illusion in any way friend just to see it for what it is that is the purified form david exactly it is simple perhaps you have been aware of lack of competition among your thoughts which even though they may conflict can occur together and in great numbers you may indeed be so used to this that it causes you little surprise yet you are also used to classifying some of your thoughts as more important larger or better wiser or more productive and valuable than others this is true of the thoughts that cross the mind of those who think they live apart for some are reflections of heaven while others are motivated by the ego which but seems to think text chapter 14 section 10 there is the ordering that we have been talking about the mind projects images and then tries to bring order into chaos by ordering those images it tries to judge in order to bring security to bring a sense of wholeness into a chaotic situation what is the chaotic situation it is the belief in two thought systems that are completely irreconcilable friend lack of competition among your thoughts what is that about david that is when you think one thing and then you think another thing it happens so often that you are totally accustomed to the back and forth do this no do that the chatter goes on all the time and the mind does not stop to say wait a minute it cannot be both the clear mind would see that there is something that needs to be discerned here these are competing thoughts but they seem to be coexisting the result is a weaving changing pattern that never rests and is never still it shifts unceasingly across the mirror of your mind and the reflections of heaven last but a moment and grow dim as darkness blots them out where there was light darkness removes it in an instant and alternating patterns of light and darkness sweep constantly across the mind the little sanity that still remains is held together by a sense of order that you establish yet the very fact that you can do this and bring any order into chaos shows you that you are not an ego and that more than an ego must be in you for the ego is chaos and if it were all of you no order at all would be possible yet though the order you impose upon your mind limits the ego it also limits you 
To order is to judge, and to arrange by judgment. Therefore it is not your function, but the Holy Spirit's. Text chapter 14, section 10 That brings together some of the ideas that we have been talking about. The mind believes that it can order its own thoughts. It is still into the hierarchy. That is what is keeping reality and happiness, our true function, obscured from our mind. It will seem difficult for you to learn that you have no basis at all for ordering your thoughts. This lesson the Holy Spirit teaches by giving you the shining examples of miracles to show you that your way of ordering is wrong, but that a better way is offered you. The miracle offers exactly the same response to every call for help. It does not judge the call. It merely recognizes what it is and answers accordingly. It does not consider which call is louder or greater or more important. You may wonder how you, who are still bound to judgment, can be asked to do that which requires no judgment of your own. The answer is very simple. The power of God, and not of you, engenders miracles. The miracle itself is but the witness that you have the power of God in you. That is the reason why the miracle gives equal blessing to all who share in it. And that is why also everyone shares in it. The power of God is limitless. And being always maximal, it offers everything to every call from anyone. There is no order of difficulty here. A call for help is given help. Text, Chapter 14, Section 10, Para 6 This is the very first principle of the Course. There is no order of difficulty in miracles. Text chapter 1, section 1 But as long as I have a hierarchy of illusions, as long as I am ordering my own thoughts, I cannot choose a miracle. I am literally choosing my judgment in place of a miracle. They cannot coexist. That is why in healing, whenever there is concern for the symptoms of the patient, there is ordering of thoughts. I know what a healthy patient looks like and I know what a sick patient looks like. I say this one looks sick. But the sickness is the ordering of thought. This pulls it back from the realm of behavior. Even a good part of the manual for teachers is written at more of a metaphorical level. For the mind that still believes it is a body and believes that there are other bodies... Some are called healers, some are called patients, some are called teachers, and some are called students. But we are pulling it all back to the mind. You see how all of that dissolves when you come up to this level? 
it gets more and more simple. It is very empowering to realize that it is not complicated. There is nothing to figure out in the world of form.